Welcome back. It's not often that the same newspaper features in two stories we do in the same broadcast. However, that is the case this week with the UK's Daily Telegraph, the country's best-selling daily broadsheet paper. In addition to being part of the Abu Ghraib photo story, the Telegraph has also been at the heart of a huge political scandal in Britain. Every day for the past month, the Telegraph has been publishing the expense reports of British members of Parliament, naming and shaming those who have taken liberties. There have been some high-level resignations, calls for criminal investigations, even suggestions that the scandal could bring down the entire government, all over a story about money that the Telegraph paid money to get. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now on checkbook journalism, political skullduggery, and a good old-fashioned scoop. Why on earth were you claiming £15,000 on your daughter's flat? British lawmakers have been claiming taxpayer money for themselves, even as folks over there struggle to get by in this recession. There is still, a lot of people would say, a nasty smell about a lot of this. When the expenses stories just started to break in the Telegraph, I think the first reaction of everybody in the Commons was shock. It's not a car crash for the government, it's a multiple pile-up, frankly. I think a state of complete shock to see these stories coming out day after day. I've done nothing criminal. That's the most awful thing. And do you know what it's about? Jealousy. I've got a very, very large house. Without this story, without the Telegraph, without the media, we would never have known what a collection of corrupt, lying weasels run our country. The Daily Telegraph started at the top with revelations about Prime Minister Gordon Brown's expenses. Over the next few weeks, revelations about other members of Parliament, MPs, became increasingly colourful. One MP claimed for a floating duck house to protect the birds from foxes. Another maintained he was allowed to clean his moat at taxpayers' expense. The cleaning and the maintenance and the looking after has to be done by somebody. All the claims that I made were agreed in advance with the fees office. In this case, you can't overhype what this story says about our parliament and the kind of people who are our MPs. One MP from Leicestershire, Keith Vaz, has put in for 22 silk uh, pillows, uh, silk cushions. 22? The bloke lived in a one-bedroom flat and he put in for seven doors. The Daily Telegraph has refused to confirm how much it paid for a terabyte of data with two million documents. It did, though, confirm its source, John Wick, a former member of the British Army's elite SAS unit. He says he had to act after being sent examples of both the edited and unedited versions of the MP's expenses database. There was an unredacted version and two redacted versions, and the briefing I was given is the fees office had sent them back twice for MPs to cover and take things out. The Daily Telegraph published the expenses details shortly before the information was due to be made public. Journalist Heather Brooke had spent five years trying under the Freedom of Information law to get the details that the Telegraph got in an instant with a checkbook. And if the government had had its way, we would not have even seen any of these receipts uh, at all. There are claims that many of the details released under the law would have been edited out. The Daily Telegraph says it got everything. We've reached a stage in society where they want to know everything about us. I think we're entitled to know ab about them. When the history of this scandal is written, I think people reflect how immensely stupid it was of the House of Commons to try to resist Heather Brooks's attempts to put these into the public domain on proper terms. Because the result of the Telegraph having this story exclusively, however they obtained it, is that they can be judge and jury on the cases which they bring into the public domain. Good afternoon and thank you very much for coming. Openly supportive of the opposition Conservative Party, the Daily Telegraph claims in this story it is not favouring one side over the other. But the expenses details came out in the weeks leading up to the European and local elections and dealt Gordon Brown's government a severe blow. One cabinet minister quits, at least two more look not long for this world. Who's calling the shots? If I was the Labour Party, I'd be rather frustrated that all the early stories were about Labour Party that uh, are misdeeds. And only after that, and after a lot of the public anger had been vented, did some of the Tory names start to come up on the list. There's no doubt that the end result of this story is that it benefits the Conservative Party, 
the Telegraph newspaper is an avowedly, openly uh, conservative supporting newspaper. But I think, generally speaking, they've been pretty even-handed. Could you tell me how much are you being paid out of the license fee? The revelations put politicians on the defensive. What is it? My, my salary yes. is £92,000. £92,000. So you're paid nearly twice as much as a member of parliament to come on and talk nonsense. But accusations of hypocrisy rarely scored points. That doesn't mean we're perfect. I would like to see an even more independent uh, approach from the media towards politics. But it, it does uh, remind us that sometimes the British media, which is so often reviled for being aggressive and biased, can actually blast things apart uh, and shine some light into the democratic process. Even if there were expenses fiddling of the rate that the MPs are at it, in commercial life, you'd be out the door at 100 miles an hour. And it's not just food they've spent hundreds of thousands of pounds of taxpayers' money on, everything from mattresses and televisions to gardeners and cleaners. The expenses story has led the news in the UK for several weeks, but while the media obsess over the details, are other more complex and important stories being ignored? Of course this is a big story, of course it's a big scandal, but I do wonder whether we've got it all out of proportion. Millions of people starved to death in Zimbabwe, nothing. Millions of people die in Darfur, nothing. Somebody buys a bath plug at the public expense and there's pandemonium. It took a lone campaigner, uh, a mixture of internet activists, and then the Telegraph coming along and doing some uh, brilliant investigation and brilliant uh, follow-up work. But it has to be asked, was the media doing its job in the first place to allow this system to evolve, this system of cover-up and secrecy uh, and self-indulgence? No longer will she be seen on the cabinet benches. Hazel Blears follows Jackie Smith, falling on her sword. Several cabinet ministers have resigned. Countless others have chosen not to run for re-election, and the Prime Minister is under increasing pressure to step down. The Telegraph source says it was worth the money. It has to be done. Parliament would, would be a better place. Society would be a better place. Sometimes a marker has to be put down. The public's put a marker down. It's good. More Global Village Voices now on the Daily Telegraph and the expenses story. We're told that the media plays an important role in our democracy, setting the people's agenda. But what happens when the media has its own agenda? Checkbook journalism, manufacturing discontent to sell more newspapers. This is what's been evident in the last two weeks. No one's had any big discourse or debate about the pros and cons of the current expenses system, or a proportionate representation and electoral reform, or paying politicians more. The way in which it has been depicted by the media implies all MPs are guilty, which is not the case. But I suspect it does apply to the majority. If Parliament had not tried to suppress the story by hiring top legal team to argue that they should be exempt from the Freedom of Information Act, it would not, not have drawn such public attention and media scrutiny. Finally, during last year's presidential election in the U.S., immigration was a bit of an issue usually raised by conservatives who said that waves of illegal immigrants were hurting America. Not everyone there agreed with that conclusion, and we're guessing that the people at the American Comedy Network are among the skeptics. They've taken the American National Anthem, a song that goes back almost 200 years, and they fitted it with some brand new lyrics on what life in the home of the brave might be like if there weren't so many immigrants there to do the work. It's our Internet Video of the Week. We'll see you next time at the Listening Post. Jose, can you mow all the grass on my lawn? And when you're done there, could you rake out the flower bed? And could you ask your wife when the dishes are done?
Cause there's no 